Welcome everyone to this uh, particularly special edition of the music department's live web chat. Um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, I've managed to coerce the various band members of Hollowhead into joining me in the studio this afternoon um, for a chat about their music. Um, the, uh, the band released their debut EP over the weekend. Uh, which has provided a, a fascinating addition to the musical landscape. Uh, so this is an opportunity to bring the band members together and get them to talk about their various musical influences and also about the particular challenges of working together, creating, uh, writing, recording and releasing an EP during this very strange year that we've all been having. So it seems appropriate to, to begin the, uh, uh, an interview with the band by listening to the, the beginning of the track that brought them onto the musical scene, which is this wonderfully dark-hued uh, track. So what we'll do now is just very briefly play a little bit of the opening. And uh, what I'll do as well is just play you, this was what first got me hooked into this EP uh, about having and having the idea to talk to the band was the way that their very first track uh, began. So let's have a, a very brief listen to the very, very beginning. So, sorry to cut you off there, Amy. So, uh, let's have a look uh, uh, and, and introduce the various band members one by one who've created that sound. So, first up, Amy. Welcome, Amy. Hi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and the kind of music that you listen to. Um, I am I'm called Amy, Amy Tokel. I'm from Bath, but originally Turkey. Um, and I'm studying, I'm in my third year doing English and drama at Kent Uni. Um, I've always been like really into rock since um, being tiny and um, influenced through my parents' tastes, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and just all sorts kind of expanding from that experimental rock. I really liked um, musical theatre when I was younger. So a lot of kind of theatrical influences in my music tastes. And who do you, um, who's big on your Spotify playlist then? Uh, up there, I've got um, System of a Down, uh, Marilyn Manson. Um, yeah, bands like that. I'm sure I'll remember some more as we go on. <laughs> Excellent. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, next up is Joshua. Welcome, Joshua. Hello. Hello. Um, so so again, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Bedfordshire. Uh, I'm the guitarist and, and part-time vocalist for the band. Um, yeah, I'm just so happy to be here. I'm happy to have the EP out, and I'm glad that, that people are listening to it. Thank you very much. That's the thing, isn't it? It's about not only uh, in these days, not about creating the music, but it's also jumping up and down, telling people all about it and so on. What sort of music do you listen to yourself? Um, so kind of, um, what is it called? Like Stoner Rock, I call it like that, like Queens of the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. I know since joining the band, my my tastes have gone everywhere kind of um inspirations from craig and amy it's all over the place now but i think if i had to pick one band it'd be queens of the stone age so actually part of being in the band is is, is sharing musical influence with you or, or in fact brainwashing you into listening to what they like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely indoctrination excellent oh good well, there's a there's another name for another band later on <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the final band member is Craig. Welcome, Craig. Hello, I am Craig. I am the bassist, sometimes vocalist, 
uh, sometimes uh -huh. other things as well. We all, we'll try and uh, mix it up a bit. Uh, I'm from Whistable, so I'm the local boy. And uh, I'm very into like punky, noisy stuff, uh, all the way to the other end of the spectrum, like your Nick Drake's, your, your acoustic, quiet okay. things. Uh, anything and, experimental basically gets me going. And that's that's quite interesting to hear, given how sort of darkly driven the the, the band's EP is. You know, someone yeah. as, as lyrical and as melodically inventive as Nick Drake. Uh, do you find sort of is it possible to discern elements of some of those in 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 what you're producing at the moment? Um, I feel like it's getting there. There's certainly little elements of it here and there in the EP, but I think that's mm. more prevalent in the songs we're currently writing. Uh huh. And if that, that's that's one of the the, the, the things to talk about um, is is obviously we've kind of you know we've been through the various kind of lockdown systems and various kind of different tiers and so on. So there's been a a lot of of means in which you know creative work and and creative artists have found what they are doing has been really interrupted and hampered and almost ground to a halt. And one of the things that fascinated me was was the fact that you'd actually taken this situation and used it as an opportunity to create something and put something out there rather than just simply stopping and saying, right, we, you know, we, we can't do anything, so we won't do anything as a lot of businesses, a lot of industry and a lot of creative types are. You've actually taken this as an opportunity to say, no, we, we are going to keep working. And we are, in fact, going to release something. So how did... How did you find that, Amy, in particular? How did you find working um, under all that pressure in, in, in such different ways uh, at the same time as, as putting together your EP? Um, well, I think firstly, like, it wasn't really a question of do we keep doing music or do we not? I, ne I never remember having that conversation. It just kind of was like, okay, so we were going to record, so now this is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was certainly tricky, um, kind of having to do everything separately and you don't have the same kind of support from your band members actually being in the room with you mm -hmm. while you're recording. Um, so it's a fairly lonely and frustrating experience. <laughs> um, but no, it was really good. I think um, like drummers all over the internet were like, if you're drumming this you have no excuse now this is the best time it's the only time you're going to get to like really knuckle down mm. um get some practice get recording in any way you can so um, did you did you find that as band members you were all recording and, and sharing audio files and then playing and, and recording over the top of that and sending it back was there a lot of bat batting back and forth of, of media files we did a lot didn't we <laughs> uh, there was some problem solving early on as well because uh it's hard to get the the same energy uh, as a live performance when you're recording, when you're in, all in separate rooms, in separate mm -hmm. houses. Um, yeah, so <laughs> a lot of back and forth with the with the files. And did you did, did you find there was a particular way? Did did having to work in this very different way force you into into exploring other creative ways of working that you actually stumbled across and found worked that, that you might not have considered because you didn't have to work in this very strange way. Um, I think one thing we discovered uh, was how fun it is to have fully record a song three or four times. So I think uh, <laughs> from start to finish, we uh, we recorded final song. I think the the finished one is is the third time through because mm -hmm. um, like the first time round, uh, the recordings we did didn't match up or there was latency issues, and the second time round, another problem. Um, but that's definitely given us the, the determination <laughs> to get the uh, the EP out. Um, but yeah, no, it's just nice to have, have that extra time to really, really think about what we're doing. And although although we're laughing at it, the, yeah. the time taken to actually actually record a couple of times gave us more more opportunity to, to better ourselves. Yeah, and the kind of creative freedom to um, experiment a bit with what you were doing versus like what you now have time to try out, I guess. Mm. Were you like everyone else, where you tried to play live together or at the, over the internet when, when March hit and, and you just discovered it was a complete disaster and latency defeated any attempt to actually be playing together live at the same time? What That's was exactly it? Right. We, we were like purposefully playing a beat uh, ahead. A beat or ahead, <laughs> yeah. We worked out a certain time signature that, that somehow worked if Amy was a beat ahead of Joshua and I. It was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't yeah. work. No, that's right, and 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 in fact, I don't think as as uh, 
there's been as much uh, technological, creative, professional development as there is for everyone when you suddenly find yourself grappling with having to set up your own studio and investing in equipment and teaching yourself how to use audio production things and all the various technological skills that suddenly everyone amassed because they were having to do things remotely and do things over Zoom. Um, what, had you had you written most of the material before March and before lockdown struck, or, or, or were you writing throughout the sort of March to August period? So I think out of the the four song EP, we had the first three songs uh, written and we'd perform them live. Mm -hmm. um, our last gig was in March, and I think maybe a day before that gig, we wrote Bear, which was the last song on the EP. Mm -hmm. um, so it was still very rough by the time we went into lockdown but the the couple of rehearsals we had when when it was legal to do so mm. um allowed us to kind of work on bear and get it to a point where we were really happy with it so it's just that that time period was mostly getting our heads around the process of recording and how do we try and capture the energy we want to get across um which was which was good yeah you'd have like a kind of loads of different experiments like go do a couple of press ups or like <laughs> a lap a lap or two of the garden and then sit down and try and play it as if you're at a gig <laughs> that's not a that's not a, a warm-up method that you see most professionals say oh, yes before before i go on stage i do a lap of my garden you know i can't remember if you've ever said that before but i guess was that just a way of trying to psych yourself up and give yourself the, the yeah, energy and, 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 and like soul. adrenaline that is just missing when you're sat in your bedroom because okay. I think that's the difficulty, isn't it? When you're confined to, to to working and playing and recording in what is your domestic environment that you associate with leisure and, and everything, trying to get into the mindset of, of thinking of it as a studio environment and the, the focus and the discipline and the energy of performing when you're when you're in your lounge or your kitchen or somewhere that's very domestic is it's very hard to get into that mindset, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very different being in your bedroom compared to Amy's garage with like spiders falling on you and <laughs> asbestos in the ceiling. <laughs> we really are hearing all about the glamour of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever hire out your garage as a recording studio, Amy, make sure you don't mention that on your program. No, no. I, actually, I actually bought some asbestos with me just so I could feel like getting that zone. You know. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, excellent. So... One of the things that I found interesting about, about what you've done with your debut EP is that you released it on cassette, which is wonderfully retro at a time when everyone is going digital and it's all about sharing information and, 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 and things digitally. You know, and I'm, I'm far older than you guys and I, cassette was, was the medium on which I grew up. You know, every Saturday, going down to the local library in Sussex and 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 taking home fistfuls of cassettes to listen to. Cassette was was the thing that 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 that, that music brought music into the home. And now we're in the digital age. You've decided to return to that as a as a medium. What what prompted that decision then? Um, so however long I've, I've known Craig, um, kind of we've both had uh, tape decks and little mini Walkman. So we used to just enjoy making mixtapes for each other. Um, whether it's seriously doing it or not seriously doing it. Um, and I think that's kind of where it grew from, uh, mm -hmm. just kind of that, that tangibility of not only being able to listen to it at Spotify, but actually taking up space, something that you can look at and can hold um, and just do more with than put in your playlist and forget about it until it comes on, on shuffle. Because I think that's that's the thing that, that the digital era loses, isn't it? You can't, the, the you know, wonderful gatefold albums of all the sort of prog rock LPs from the 70s that, that are in my collection, you know, so the, the physicality of opening the gatefold album and exploring the art and the lyrics and so on that you don't get when you simply add a playlist onto Spotify and, and, and play it over your phone. Did you, did you, did you find that there was a, 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 an interest? Did people respond to the fact that you'd chosen such a retro medium to release? yeah um like quite a few people that have been interested in getting one and now buying tape players so they can listen to it <laughs> um, which is really flattering that's lovely um so you're sort of the band is single-handedly driving up the sale <laughs> <of the tape. laughs> i hope so i hope so um but like um something about that kind of 
it adds a personal sound. Um, we were saying the other day about the kind of decay of tape, um, yeah. which is pretty kind of harsh. I mean, the sounds anyway when you when you're listening to a tape is fairly distorted, um, not at all clean, which um, echoes something that we've tried to. Well, maybe slightly inadvertently, but also tried to do with our music, which is like a sort of imperfection mm -hmm. um, idea of imperfection. Um, yeah, because we're fairly lo-fi anyway. Yeah. And also, I think it's it's the kind of the permanence, like the the physical manifestation of some songs in your hand, you know. And also, mm -hmm. when you put it on, you got to listen to the end or get to the B side. You can't you can't skip it. Skipping is way too easy to do on when you're streaming music. Yeah, abs absolutely. That's right. And I think, yes, as, as Amy was saying about the decay, you know, um, every time you play a cassette, there is a, 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 a modicum of degradation of sound, isn't there? So you you end up sort of destroying the music that you love by listening to it on cassette somehow, even in even though it's only in sort of minute steps. And actually that then makes each time you listen to your own cassette unique to you as your listening experience, isn't it? It's like having an LP with your own scratchy, clippy kind of things on it. When you listen to that, no one else has that kind of degradation of sound. So it makes it a uniquely personal listening experience in a way that the perfection of, of digital streaming somehow sort of defeats. But obviously that fits the aesthetic of the band, is it rather nicely? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've got an even more unique one. I've got one where we're all pitched down a little bit by accident. We had, uh, <laughs> We, we ran into several problems while uh, trying to trying to record our cassettes, which right. made the experience. I think it brought us together. <laughs> Let's just say that it brought us together. Does that does that mean there were some sort of frank exchanges of views and the occasional harsh word, or was it a fairly amicable experience? Oh no, no we all got along very well. But um, tapes, the, oh, no, recording them was a very difficult experience. Right. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, I think all, all our tape machines broke around the same time. All of yeah. our record buttons stopped yeah. like pushing in. Oh, it was um, the universe sending us a sign and we fought yeah. against it and we released it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's brilliant. So you actually sort of faced adversity head on and, and rose to the challenge and, and still went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah, for better or for worse, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> One of the really um, uh, engaging aspects of, 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 of the EP when I listened to it was the final track. Uh, and what I'll do just before we talk about that is very briefly play uh, track number four. Although it's uh, confusing, it's track number three on your Spotify list, but um, it's track number four on, on the other platform. That I listen. Has that moved or, or not? Might be some gremlins in the machine. Gremlins in the machine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's have a listen to track number three or track number four, depending on how you're listening to it. Uh, the remarkable repeat. <laughs> not have done and let that repeat and it be and repeat i'll take that as painted and i'll leave that as not there's no need to think on and ruin a beautiful moment which is great i love the kind of quirky uh, really uncertain. There's a. I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but 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 quite a few of your tracks they begin in a way that's really. Um, it creates great a sense of uncertainty. So you don't know where the you don't know where the beat is. You don't quite sure what the time signature is. You don't you don't know what key you're in, and and you, so it makes you list continue listening until you've actually got a handle on what you're listening to. Is that a, a deliberate thing? Do you like slightly wrong footing the listener at the start and then leading them in later on? I think. Um very big for us is kind of like dynamics and changes in a song. We, we we aim to not ever have a song that's just the same all the way through, kind of a, a verse, chorus, bridge, very standard structure. Um, yeah. Because people just stop listening. It's like they've heard it before. But um, hopefully, kind of as you said with the EP, because they're all um, they're different from each other, but then also different within, within themselves. They're not the same all the way through. That, that kind of... Um, drives interest and just hope represents us and kind of what we want to get across. 
because we, we talked earlier i think about how how un, it makes it very how unclassifiable and you, um, that ep is in some ways which, which i think is one of its great appeals is that you can't just pigeonhole it as you know prog or gypsy folk or dixie or you know or whatever you can't just kind of conveniently pigeonhole it and file it. It, it, it as you say each song is different from from each every other song and it makes it very very hard to sort of pin that down but but that's that's a strength in a way that the ability that you sort of defeating the ability to easily classify what you do although presumably that makes it hard to sort of you know link it into genre playlists on algorithms and so on but i, I guess you don't mind yeah and like sell ourselves when people are like oh what music do you play it's like the impossible task of choosing the genre that we want to be defined as i think we've basically unanimously decided that uh scar band is the uh <laughs> the one that we want to go for okay <laughs> that, was a joke. that was a joke we, we actually want to go by scar band <laughs> I don't really hear 80s scar in uh, in, in any of those <laughs> four tracks, but you know, may, maybe your difficult second album might embrace yeah, that. Yeah, we're saving that for the album. <laughs> yeah, it's purely like acid scar. Marvelous. Yeah. So, and having heard that brief extract from the, the from that um, final track, uh, I love the kind of tricksy uh, drum machine element to it. So, Amy, how 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 did you feel? Obviously, you're the drummer for the band. How was it when when you suddenly found yourself if I could relegate it, if that's a polite yeah. <laughs> Was that a collective decision or did you find it's yourself? Regarded. <laughs> no, no, it was a collective decision. Um, it was really, we see like, I see it as a chance to um, kind of get up from behind the kit and be able to kind of, you know, stand up and perform a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, whereas usually I'm kind of sat down and there's only so much you can do and so much you can project from behind a drum kit um also the sound of the song we wanted to go for a much more um like electronic um sound so it was like a natural decision to go for um synthesized drums yeah no hard feelings i feel, I feel like that's one that kind of grew over lockdown as well so originally I, I was playing drums for that one so mm -hmm. amy would get up from behind the kit when we were playing live um I'd get a chance to play drums, which I really enjoy, even though I'm not as good as Amy. But uh, while recording it, obviously, I don't have a drum kit, so I'm just going to use a synthesizer instead, like a little drum machine. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, I think the sound of it grew to become a bit more synthy, mm -hmm. even darker, perhaps. Yeah. So the, yeah. Actual, the actual instrumentation on the final EP arose out of the way you were forced into recording it over, over lockdown. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think it sounds probably better than it would have done. You had like, did you have Joshua's snare over lockdown? I did. I had a single snare drum, single um, snare drum. which I which I sampled. But other than that, it's all it's all made on uh, made on one of these, just a little little drum oh, yeah. machine thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it it, um, it put me in mind of of one of those sort of. Uh, something off Kid A, the Radiohead album, and so on. That sort of the difference between something that that, that is kind of live, and then it sidesteps Amnesiac, or, you know, the the one that's even more sort of darker that that followed, and so on. I quite like the the blend. It, it's an interesting sonic blend, isn't it? The way you go from live drumming to to to, to um, drum machine. Uh, again, it's a way that, that you can be more. Drum machines can be slightly more trickier, can't they? Slightly more nifty and, and light-footed sometimes in, 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 the, in the programming that makes makes the track sort of... It's an interesting track, that one number um, uh, repeat, because it, it, again, it begins with that kind of sense of uncertainty and it kind of finds its way in. And then this very nimble drum programming leaps in. And then you've got Amy's spoken word rather than, rather than sung. And it's all those three different elements that, that shouldn't work together, but somehow they do. Yeah, and somehow the, the electric guitar works its way in there and that shouldn't fit, but it just really does. And there's like that little bit of a hip hop influence with the production really, with like the kind of 808-ish bass towards the end, mm -hmm. which again, shouldn't work, but somehow it all comes together. <laughs> Sounds all right. <laughs> That's right. And it's, it's, there's something about the guitar riffs on the EP that, that are, that they, they're, I don't know if they're deliberately non-melodic, but they they're sort of very fragmentary and they sort of tease. You, you're never quite sure where quite they. Angular. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Which I think is is really engaging because you you then sort of 
um, you need to listen further to try and work out where the beat in the bar is or or what key is it in the first track you know that it sounds as though that the bass and the guitar begin in two different keys and you're never quite sure where you are which i really like that sense of right i need to listen further to to see if the two come together and reassure me that i'm in a recognized key yeah, yeah. the nightmare we have had trying to find the key <laughs> that we're writing in i can't remember i think it was the very beginnings of final song Right. So we were just sat there for hours, like, yeah, but all of these notes are in it, but then these notes aren't. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's about defeating traditional functional harmony, isn't it? It's to hell with harmony and, and, and tonality. It's just, just, just the, the key is the colour of the piece somehow. You're, it seems to me that, that, that the sound you create is more concerned with, with colour whether that's the kind of dark brooding sort of colors of the first track or the, the sort of combination of colors in the last. It's, it's, it's more about the color of a piece than it is about a particular key. Does that sound fair? Yeah, a lot of the time, um, kind of when we're, when we're jamming to try and start a new song, um, if I'm on guitar or, or Craig's on bass and we're playing something mm -hmm. and it sounds really nice, um, a lot of the time we'll, we'll pull each other up and go, uh, that sounds too, normal that sounds too easy to listen to can you change a note that that's not supposed to go there um and that kind of that's where we get the, the uh angular sound as, as, as craig has said that's where that comes from right. yeah there is a conscious effort in that to, to actually try and not be uh, uh make it sound uh, as horrible as possible yeah, sometimes we have a bit of a competition to try and make the most <laughs> sounding thing like even the intro for a final song that was a choke originally. I, I started playing um, the, the, the intro bass note just bent horribly out of key and bending it back down. And right. we, ended up, we ended up just keeping it. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's um, for the viewers at home, let's just uh, share that, that very angular introduction so that they can hear that as well. Uh, do, 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 here it is. I love that wobble. So it is, as you say, it's it's very, you know, there's kind of all the kind of pitch bend and so on. It, it, it creates that slightly hallucinatory quality of someone sort of staggering down a, a, a very dark corridor, not really knowing where they are, which I think is a, a fantastic way to, to, to you know, begin a begin an album and your first step onto the the musical landscape is one that's deliberately sort of antagonistic and uncertain and so on um is there um i mean you've talked in, about the individual influences that you have and how actually part of working together is brainwashing each other into liking the music that you each individually like is there a, a sort of um a collective influence in, in a way on, on on the band's overall sound or on the the aesthetic pull of the band that, that, that you've noticed or 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 deliberately look to follow? Um, I don't think there is. And I think that's that's something that we're very proud of. We've we've never been likened to the, the same band twice, which is something we, we pride. Right. Um, we've got this list of polar opposite bands when someone yeah. asks, well, who do you sound like? And we just <laughs> pluck one and hope it works. Right. Um, but yeah, kind of, there are there are some larger influences like um the spoken word i think it's very interesting that's very like um slint-esque with that kind of horrible guitar um <laughs> obviously this the slow kind of stoner rock but then the the harsher drums um yeah i think it's just all over the place which is, is part of its charm really you know i hear elements of you know having mentioned radiohead before but there's sort of there, there, there's elements of the cure i think that kind of dark sort of um, moody sound and so on that that hangs over the album i think very, very reminiscent of of, of um, the cure album that's got lullaby on it uh, disintegration yeah 
um, and so on, you know, all that kind of thing. So what, what's next for the band then? Obviously, Amy and Joshua, you're here until in some form or, or you know, what, whatever one can until sort of June, July graduation. Craig, you're, you're based here um, in Whitstable anyway. How, well, what's the future for the band? What's next? Oh, we've got two songs we're working on at the minute. I think they're going to be singles. Yeah. Looking at the other members of the band waiting for right. <laughs> Yeah. And are, are those songs that you've again been 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 creating and batting media files back and forth during lockdown and tier two and tier three and so on? We have um one of them was probably one of the first songs we did. We just haven't recorded it yet. And the other one was I think written over lockdown. Right. Completely written over lockdown, so but sending Sammy lyrics and chords back and forth. Took advantage of that, like whatever it was, hmm. three week gap or something, um, where we could be together, yep. and just really kind of worked it out um, and kind of came to a sound that we really liked and grew into. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back on the on the file sending <laughs> as much you, as one can. Because you said you did do a gig in, in, in March, was it shortly before lockdown arrived? You had actually done a gig in Canterbury. Oh, we were just getting our groove on when lockdown happened. I think that's another reason why we kept going. Uh, yeah. It just felt so natural to keep going. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and as, as frustrating as it is to sort of get your foot on the sort of grassroots gigging scene and then find that, that that you're not allowed to, was it? Did you take anything away from the, from the gig that you'd done as a way of keeping going through? So, how did you say you'd you'd, you'd performed your, the four songs on the EP in that gig, that one gig? I think so. I think so. I think we did. Yeah. yeah. The biggest I'm not sure if we had performed C seven. Right. Not sure. Can't remember. Was that the first time we'd performed C7, or did we not perform it that night? I don't really I don't, remember. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. No. No. Uh, um, what I learned from that gig is that we would be famous right now if it wasn't for lockdown. <laughs> of course, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you're famous simply waiting for, for, for lockdown and tier three to lift. Mm. So you can resume this kind of meteoric rise. Um, <laughs> it's inevitable. <laughs> Because <laughs> I mean, the, the great thing about sort of the, the the Kent region is is that there there are lots of opportunities for sort of gigging and and, and so on. The, the live music scene in particular areas is quite strong. Is that is that something that that you're looking to capitalise on? Have you have you got sort of ideas for for gigs lined up for when they can eventually happen? I think that it's something that we've spoken about before. Is kind of the the history of music in Canterbury. The obviously the the, the Canterbury scene, like the the wildflowers and all yeah. of the uh, the bands that come from that. Um, yeah, and it, it's something that we'd like to honour and um, kind of try and cover some of their tracks when we play, um, make sure that people know about it, because I, I didn't know about it before coming here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just, just keep it going, keeping the, the live scene moving. Mm, absolutely. Like, the idea of just revitalising live music a little bit. Um, I think there'll be a, a, a universal sense of relief, won't there, when we're able to get back to, 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 to making live music again, both for those of us who perform it, but also for the, mm. you know, for the listeners and the audiences who are waiting to get back to, in fact, the wider arts in general, you know, theatre audiences and film audiences and so on, and stand-up comedy and, and all that kind of thing, you know, there will hopefully be such a, a surge of, of relief and interest in, in the live experience that, that, that you'll be able to capitalise that on in a, in a way that, that, that might help, um, you know, have, even though you were interrupted with, with the arrival of lockdown in March. Yeah, it was heartbreaking seeing all of the um, the lack of support for the arts during lockdown, kind yeah. of no no furlough support and no um, like arts fund. Mm -hmm. um, it means that was, that... so much to everybody. Like, and then being yeah. encouraged to retrain. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was something yeah. that really kept us going to get the UP done and out as kind of a, a resilience thing. Absolutely. I guess it, it, it sort of reassures you that you are, you know, practicing musicians and that you're artists and you're creating and, and all that, because there's, there's all the additional um, creative elements of the EP. There's the album cover and so on, isn't there? And it's not just about recording the songs and away they go. You actually have to put the packaging together and so on. And that that um, wonderful album cover that, that you have that I hopefully is here. Where is it? 
Ah, oh, no, I, I had it open on my... I mean, I have the cassette here. Ah, oh, perfect. That's helpful. <laughs> well, I've got one too. Oh, there we are. Big promo. Yeah, yeah. How, how, um, how did you come by the sort of the album cover concept then? Was that again a, a sort of universal decision or? Um, a very early one, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I've got um, like Procreate on, on a tablet. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just very excited about gigging very early on. Um, so I did some sketches and that one came along and we printed off some posters for one of our gigs at Woody's. Um, and then when, when the question came up for, well, what should we do as the, the EP cover, we went through all the stuff we had and that was the idea that stuck. So just mm -hmm. reused that and turned it into the animation that you've seen on YouTube and on the, the canvas on Spotify. Um, and I think it is very distinct as well. The colors are very standoffish, which I, was something that I wanted to get across with our music as well. It doesn't blend in. Hopefully it would stand out if you were to have it lined up with other album covers released this year. Yeah, yeah. especially like you mentioned against like all of the other alt rock or experimental rock, which are likely to be like black um, album covers, dark album covers. It's nice to have one that will stand out amongst those. There it is. There we are. Suitably, um, it leaves one in no doubt as to the sort of the neo-Gothic aspirations of the band aesthetics in, in some ways. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. I think it's um, it definitely shows the hollow head bit with with his head open. That was <laughs> that that's the furthest my <laughs> certainly is hollow. <laughs> No, it's great. It's very striking, and I think it's you know it's very memorable once 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 seen it. But you know, with the the, the color scheme and so on, and, and and the actual image itself, it is very memorable. Which of course is is something that that you're looking for in 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 marketing when you're as you say you need finding ways of standing out against the competition and something that's very striking and and you know will draw the eye and or, or if talking about the sound world, drawing the ear in a way that 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 you know makes you stand out from all 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 the other ones and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's good. So I think uh, that brings us rather neatly to uh, the conclusion. So um, thank you very much to Amy, to Joshua and to Craig for, for joining me this afternoon. Um, and for the viewers at home, uh, do, if you haven't already, do take the opportunity to go and explore more of Hollowhead's uh, darkly appealing sound. Scrolling across the bottom of the screen is their link tree. Uh, web link, which is then the diaspora from which you can go and visit all their other sound streaming and so on. So my thanks to the band members for joining us. Um, do keep an eye on um, Hollowhead, as I'm sure that, uh, as Craig predicted, this is the beginning of their meteoric rise to fame once lockdown lifts. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, enjoy the anticipation of going to hear their music live. So uh, that's it from me. Uh, thanks very much to the band. And thank you to everyone at home for watching.